This video isn't going to be about a book. It's going to be about a computer game. A computer game that I cannot stop thinking about. I will talk about the writing in this game, but first I want to tell you how I got here. I got my first taste of what it would be like to be a starfighter, explorer, space lane trader with Privateer 2 The Darkening, which came out in 1996. It's an open world RPG with exploration, trade, bounty hunting. Every planet that you land at in this game has a rich and singular aesthetic from the fascist prison planet to the cyberpunk planet. There was this one water world, which unfortunately I couldn't find footage of, where the landing sequence has you flying down into this man-made vortex to access this underwater base. The atmosphere of this game encouraged my imagination to fill in details that weren't even present. The story of the game is cliched and it's okay, it's fine. But the acting, and it had live action cutscenes, the acting caliber in these cutscenes was just bananas. Oh, the guys did. Malachi's dead. Went down with the Canera. Listen, does the name Reinhardt mean anything to you? Maybe. Maybe a code name for one of Kronos' lieutenants. Despite the great acting and the clear love that the developers put into this game, it was nonetheless a product of its time. You are getting too close. The combat gets repetitive after a while, and once you've written down all the best trade routes, you pretty much know all there is to know about the game. After Privateer 2, the next obvious game to play was X-Wing vs. TIE Fighter, which came out in 1997. X-Wing is an absurdly technical game. There was this pamphlet that came with the game that I would have to prop up behind my keyboard to remind myself of what all the buttons do. But I had a lot more tolerance for bullshit when I was 13. And I loved the tactical decision making in this game. I love the way every ship in this game has its own feel. X-Wings are brawlers, A-Wings are fencers, TIEs have this mosquito energy, Y-Wings are complete dog shit. I wish I could find the exact quote, but I read on some forum about this game, some fan posted and was talking about how terrible it was to fly the Y-Wings and how you were just getting crushed by the TIE Fighters all the time. And he ended the post with, if you think TIE Fighters are bad, the TIE Interceptors are going to hit you so hard your mama's going to feel it back on Corellia. X-Wing wasn't open world like Privateer was. There were very specific short missions that you had to accomplish, and you had to sort of plan out your strategy and prioritize your targets. It was the sort of game where you would try and recruit your sibling to act as co-pilot on the keyboard while you used the joystick and throttle. There was an absurd amount to keep track of. You could allocate power to different systems. If you boosted shields, you had to take that power away from your engines or your weapon system. You could set your deflector shields to double front or double rear. You had to manage countermeasures. Selecting targets was an incredible pain because you just had to cycle forward or backward. And a lot of the bigger targets, the Star Destroyers and such, actually had a ton of these subsystems that you could target meaningfully. Like if you destroyed a turbo laser battery, that battery would no longer fire at you. Your turning radius in this game was affected by how fast you were going. I think it was at one third velocity, you had the best turning radius. So you were constantly changing speeds mid dogfight. You could switch back and forth between missiles and guns. You could change whether your guns fired all together or in sequence. Basically the learning curve on this game was steep. I've been chasing the high of these two games, Privateer and the X-Wing games, ever since I played them. They weren't perfect, but what they lacked hinted at what could be. In 2003, Freelancer came out. In this game, you play as bargain bin Han Solo. Make sure he lives. He owes me some credits. The story is super bland, but the controls are smooth. The game is very colorful. The universe is big. However, it did promise a lot of things that it never actually delivered on, like a dynamic economy. Fans of the game made modifications to it with lots of really interesting additions. They added the ability to pilot capital ships, they expanded the mining aspect of the game, they made goods in the game that decayed, so you were really motivated to find an efficient route to get those goods delivered to wherever you were selling. The modding community is even still active, and it's really awesome. Some of the mods that were made to this game still constitute the best space fighting, trading, exploring games that exist. But that also makes me wonder, why hasn't there been any advancement in this from a professional developer since 2003?
In 2019, Rebel Galaxy Outlaw came out, but this game was just freelancer, but worse. I own the game, and I still didn't even bother getting any footage for it. I'm certainly not the only person that craves this space simulation, exploration, dogfighting, you know, fly around in the Star Wars universe or something like it. In 2015, Elite Dangerous was released. And basically, if you take an actual map of the Milky Way galaxy, embellish it with some space stations, aliens, and more planets than we're strictly certain exist, then slap Microsoft Flight Simulator on it, you've got Elite Dangerous. And while I appreciate the ambition and have to admit to a certain amount of awe at being able to explore tens of thousands of actual star systems, it's way too big for the developer to put any care into making particular locations interesting, and the learning curve on this game is steeper than the side of the Cedars Tower. Star Citizen came out in 2015-ish, but is continually and still and forever will be in development. And if you've ever wanted to know what it's like to experience real life in space down to the simulation of individual nose hairs, then this is the game for you. It's got phenomenal graphics, and it's certainly a technical achievement, but it's also a gigantic sloppy mess. And the developers of this game are spending more time adding game mechanics rather than focusing on making any particular mechanic any fun quarter we'll begin to bring new systems that take more and more of our attention away from these little things. So in short, I've never really found anything that lived up to my nostalgia and my imagination of what those earlier games could be. But what if you took X-Wing's focus on bite-sized tactical missions, and you took Privateer's brooding atmosphere and put them together into a game that is laser-focused on actually having fun gameplay alongside an easy-to-learn but difficult to master arcade-style control scheme. Well, that sounds ideal. And if you did that, you would probably end up with House of the Dying Sun, which was released in 2016. Yeah, it came out in 2016, but I only just discovered it and I cannot get it off my mind. So this is my YouTube channel and I wanna talk about it. The plot is that the Emperor is dead at the hands of a conspiracy of Lords and you have been awoken from cryogenic storage or some equivalent, to enact revenge on the traitors. You are a killing machine born and bred for one purpose, but will you be able to overcome your conditioning and wipe out the imposter who sits on the throne, even if it means destroying the very world you swore to protect? This introduction gives us an immediate inciting incident, a clear goal and a strong motive, as well as obstacles that are in the way of the protagonist from completing the goal. And there's also a disturbing aspect to it all that is, thank goodness, self-aware. That part at the end of the intro about bringing ruin to their people, it's not exactly a good look. Are we the baddies? The discomfort's interesting to me. I connected with the story at a deeper level because of this discomfort I felt. And I'll say more about the writing later, but allow me to digress back into video game stuff. This is not an open world game, but takes place in little missions selected from a hub. Some of the missions are microscopically small, and the main complaint I see about the game online is that it's short. And that's a pretty fair complaint. I'm one of the people who would love to see an open world game with a galaxy to explore that had these sorts of visuals, audio, and controls. What really makes this game great is how all the elements synergize together into an immersive experience. The graphics aren't the highest end, especially when you're looking at the asteroids, but they are used well with dark darks and bright brights that give a feel of the harsh environment of outer space. The controls are easy to learn. I play this on an Xbox controller plugged into my computer, and while I was getting started, I didn't even use a bunch of the features like drifting or turn braking or even remembering that I had this big missile that I can use once per level. Hell, I'm pretty sure that on the first couple levels at the easiest difficulty setting, you can beat those levels with just the two thumbsticks and your trigger finger. And I was having fun, despite not even remembering a lot of the mechanics in the game. As I've gotten better, the depth of the gameplay has revealed itself, and I've experienced that joy of learning, that joy of figuring out how the mechanics can be used. Then there's the sound design. Holy crap.
As every nerd will tell you, well, actually, there's no sound in the vacuum of outer space. Sure, but humans rely on hearing to absorb information, and this is just a game. House of the Dying Sun applies a muffling effect to all the sounds external to the cockpit. And this totally works to make it feel like you're in outer space without losing the sound effects entirely. And even though all the explosions sound like you're hearing them from the other side of a concrete wall underwater with noise-canceling headphones on, they still sound impactful and I'm left with no doubt that the individuals downrange of my guns are having a very bad day. That combined with the scratchy radio and authentic beepy cockpit noises and strained breathing suggestive of pushing air into your lungs while pulling 6Gs creates this immersive experience. But this is a writing channel, so let's talk writing. There's not that much of it, but what there is, is used skillfully to build mystery and intrigue the player. I summarized the plot earlier, but honestly a lot of that I pieced together in hindsight only after finishing the game. At first I was like, who is this main character? And the game was like, I'm vengeance. Okay. I'm vengeance. Of course, I mean, hey, where are you going? The main character doesn't really have a personality, but the universe has a distinct personality of its own, and every bit of text enhances this feeling of this harsh, feudal future. The language that's used in the game is more interested in conveying authenticity than clarity. It's more interested in mood than information. And it works because there's a clear goal and clear motivation. In fact, I think the ambiguity enhances my curiosity, and I felt encouraged to use my own imagination to fill in the gaps. I avoided looking up information about this game online, because I'm still exploring alternative endings and unlockable text, but the limited information provided with its unexplained characters and engrossing vibe makes me want to go write or read fanfiction about this game. It's so intriguing to me that I desperately want to fill in the gaps. One lesson I take away is closely tied to what I talked about in the Memory of Empire video, microtension. The strategic use of ambiguity and contradiction to induce feelings of unease and curiosity in the reader. When the game writes, Do you remember when we were not ourselves? Who else remembers that I was ever not the Emperor? I remember when you were not yet my dragon. I am the only one. Do you ever wish that you could die? Or do you wish, my dragon, do you pray instead that the war will never end? I wonder about this other war and its context. Or this. Thou shalt keep only one copy of thy soul. Thou shalt keep it in one fixed place. Thou shalt not possess the unwilling body, unless thou art my dragon. This is one of the most sci-fi aspects of the text because generally it's really just space fantasy. But now I'm curious about the Imperial laws and who they chafe and who they benefit. There's a lot to be said for being indirect in limited quantities. But the author does need to have all the answers, and I'm convinced that the writers of House of the Dying Sun know and believe in the fullness and reality of their universe. And that's what I want to convince my readers of as well. I think a lot of the real lesson here is to pursue what inspires you, whatever the medium may be. I lost sleep writing as I was inspired by this game. I want to write my own universe that thrills me the way that this game does. I've got a whole novel worth of ideas already sketched out and a draft in progress, and I'm just having a blast coming up with ideas and writing them down and seeing where they go. In the same way that as a child I started writing because I was inspired by games and movies, I'm inspired by this game. I felt a desperate need to recreate the amazement that I was experiencing. So let me try to recap some of the lessons here. First off, discomfort. The reader is put into the shoes of this vengeful angel. He's a bad guy doing bad things because that's what he was trained to do. I don't relate to this character, but I do have an emotional response to him, and that's important. Next is the mystery. There's very little text in this game, but what is there is always teasing at a bigger picture. The Emperor is almost sad when he talks to his dragon. Like the two of them are such old beings that there's no one else that he can relate to. But that's entirely me bringing that idea to this story. Nowhere is that directly in the text. There's a fine line between confusing your reader and intriguing your reader. And this game hits it. Now that's admittedly easier for a video game because 
As long as I know what the in-game objective is, I don't really have to care about what the story arc is. When I'm writing a book or a short story, the story is the whole thing. I need to know what the character's objectives are and why. And I need to know that not just on a minute-to-minute -minute basis, but in a bigger picture sense as well. To be clear, the I I'm talking about is the reader. The author obviously needs to know these things as well, but the author has to communicate them to the reader. In my writing, I've been challenging myself lately to write in such a way to set up a little bit of mystery and then resolve it. And the resolution might happen as soon as the next sentence. It doesn't have to be a lot further down in the text. The example that comes to mind is the opening to Neil Gaiman's The Graveyard book which opens with something like, there was a knife in the dark. In some ways, that's really obnoxiously vague. Who's holding the knife? What sort of knife is it? Is there cause to be alarmed? But that's exactly the point, is that the reader is immediately asking all of those questions, and they get resolved momentarily, literally sentences or paragraphs later, but that's already driving the reader forward with curiosity. It's a dangerous way to write a story, and it's also a dangerous way to create a game, because in a very real sense, this game does not satisfy. Instead, it leaves you wanting more. Have you ever been to a restaurant and you ate a big meal, but the dessert menu looks so good, so you get something off the dessert menu, and while you're eating it, you suppose you're enjoying it, you certainly want to be enjoying it, but you're feeling a bit sick and regretting your decision. That's what so many other computer games have felt like to me in recent years. But sometimes, you go to a restaurant and you've eaten your meal and you get the, just the perfect dessert. It's just the right amount and you feel full, but you also feel satisfied. And when you get home, all you can think is, we need to eat at that place again. And that's House of the Dying Sun. So speaking of overeating, this one time my parents were dog sitting and they brought me along. They just had to refill the food and water. Apparently these dogs only eat as much as they need, so they could have food enough for three days just sitting out, and they already had access to a fenced-in yard. So anyway, Mommy drops us all off and then goes to run errands. Daddy takes care of refilling food and water and picking up poop, and us doggies are all just playing in the yard. And then Daddy sits down inside to get work done on his laptop, but unbeknownst to him, I sneak back in the doggy door. When Mommy returns, she's like, Hey, I asked you to feed the dogs, and Daddy's like, I did! Then they see me, and I'm looking a bit, shall we say, heavy. So yeah, I ate three days worth of food for three dogs. I don't regret nothing. And let the record show that I didn't whine at all when my parents made me skip dinner that evening. Took a big old doggy dump in the morning, and it was otherwise fine. What's the big deal?